Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Appreciate the chance to uh, be here with the committee today. Mr. Chairman, I believe this committee and the Senate should follow the lead of the House of Representatives and vote to override Nevada's veto and to allow a full and objective final decision on Yucca Mountain uh, to be made by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, as you indicated, the history of this program is, is a very long one. It dates back to Congress's decision uh, in 1982 to begin the process by passing the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, committing to a responsibility uh, for, for radioactive waste disposal in this country. Uh, since that time, and even actually before it, uh, research had been conducted uh, in conjunction with the site at Yucca Mountain. That research now uh, has spanned 24 years. Uh, it has been uh, in excess of $4 billion worth of scientific investigation. To put that in perspective, that's five times longer than it took to build the Hoover Dam. It's six times the entire duration of the Manhattan Project, <coughs> twice as long as it took to plan and complete the first moon landing. Uh, so the commitment in terms of, of energy, time, dollars, and research, I think, has been extensive. It fell to me uh, upon the completion of this extensive research effort to uh, reach a conclusion as to whether or not I could recommend this site as being suitable uh, for the storage of nuclear waste. Uh, to reach that decision, I had to consider the various research projects that have been done in the science and to try to determine two basic conclusions. First, uh, is the site suitable for the development uh, of a repository uh, based on the evaluation of the science that had been conducted for a period called the pre-closure period, that is the period from when we might start this project to the point when we might seal the mountain. To give the committee some perspective on that time frame, it's estimated to be anywhere from 50 to 300 years. In short, at its, uh, at its potentially longest period, it would exceed the actual lifetime of the United States of America. That's the period in which we would construct uh, the repository, we would accept the waste into it, and we would monitor very closely any developments that might occur. To my knowledge, no scientific organization uh, has disputed the conclusion that we've reached that during this uh, pre-closure period, the, the, the site uh, is suitable and safe for storage. Uh, because uh, the task is very similar to that which, uh, which we have done in other contexts. Uh, Yucca Mountain will be a controlled, secure operating environment, including proximity, of course, to an Air Force range and its protected airspace, plus state-of-the-art facilities. We also were required under the various congressional acts to make a determination as to whether or not the site was suitable for a post-closure period. Here the test that we were offered was a very stringent one. We were required to consider the safety and security of the site, the suitability of the site in essence, and not for 300 years but for 10,000 to make a determination in short as to whether over a period of time which um, would, would, if you were to go in reverse, uh, r return us to an age in which we were just beginning to domesticate plants, whether or not we could meet a very stringent set of safety standards. Uh, the standard, uh, in fact, uh, a 15 millirem annual radiation exposure for people living within an 18 kilometer range of this location and of a, of a uh, of a groundwater level uh, as stringent as we use for uh, major cities in this country. To get there, we conducted most of the research I just mentioned over a long period of time. We conducted it based on total system performance of the facility during this time frame. Uh, and I might say, just to put in perspective what we were talking about, we were talking about an annual exposure rate that would have to be less than that which a person might receive making uh, several, just two uh, cross-country airplane flights today. We concluded that based on total system performance of the mountain and the perspective designs uh, for it, that we would be able to meet that standard during this time frame. Now, we recognize that 10,000 years is a long period and that many potential events could transpire during that period. And so we were not only looking at it from the standpoint of a static environment, but also took into consideration a variety of factors which we uh, chose to evaluate and to take into account. Those factors uh, included such things as whether or not 
volcanic activity in the area might pose a higher radiation risk, whether seismic earthquake activity in the area could conceivably uh, cause us to not be able to meet the radiation standards, whether or not human intrusion could conceivably result in a harmful radiation exposure. By that we mean that in 10,000 years, we tried to evaluate and were required to evaluate whether in 10,000 years somebody digging for oil and drilling through the top of the mountain might cause a radiation exposure to people in this area. We of course uh, did extensive tests on whether or not water uh, from the top of the mountain might somehow seep a thousand feet down into the repository area in sufficient quantities over that period of time to somehow penetrate uh, what we believe to be the extraordinarily impenetrable uh, devices, storage packages that will be used and then have the capacity to somehow carry radioactive material another 800 feet down to the underground aquifer that is a contained aquifer. Uh, we not only con consider that in the context of the mountain's current location and rainfall exposure, which because it's next to Death Valley isn't very high, but we also even took into consideration whether or not if a new glacier age were to envelop the region and then recede, posing obviously a much larger amount of water uh, exposure to the mountain, we could still meet the standard. We, we, tr we ch uh, challenged ourselves in many other ways. And we concluded that the standards that have been set would be met even in the case of these sorts of uncertainties. Outside uh, external checks and scientific evaluations and peer groups uh, from the International Atomic Energy Agency to the United States Geological Service to our national labs and a variety of others have peer reviewed the work that's been done and support the findings which we have reached. And I am convinced of the soundness of the scientific basis for the recommendation which I made. And I've visited the site, I've talked to the scientists at great length, I've studied the many, many comments that were offered to us by a variety of people who participated in, a, in 116 hearings that have taken place. And I did so, Mr. Chairman, with great concern for the people who live in this area, the people of Nevada, as well as others in this country, weighing as, I, as best I could uh, their concerns about uh, safety and security. I am convinced that the soundness of this project uh, is uh, established and that we can move ahead and should move ahead to allow an ultimate decision uh, by the experts at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as to the licensability of this facility. Once I was convinced that the principal responsibility I had to make a determination as to whether or not this site was suitable as a repository, I did not move immediately to a final decision because I also felt it was important for us to consider national interests and whether or not there were sufficiently compelling national interests to go in this direction. And as I have said before, I believe there are a number of strong and compelling national interests that support us moving ahead to the next stage and ultimately to the construction of the repository. One is energy security. Uh, a site designation clearly, <clears throat> in my judgment, will allow us to encourage continuing uh, nuclear energy production in this country. Right now nuclear energy is 20 percent of our electricity generation. It's important for us in terms of maintaining a diversity of fuels. Existing facilities uh, uh, in order to operate through their current life expectancies as well as beyond for license renewals need the uh, commitment I think that we seek to make here to have a means of dealing with nuclear waste. And I think as is well known a number of the facilities that are operating today are running out of space for the waste that we said we would accept back in 1998 in the original congressional actions. There's a strong national security argument as well. The most strategic vessels in our Navy, the largest ships and submarines are dependent upon nuclear power for propulsion. The spent fuel from those Navy reactors is currently temporarily stored in the state of Idaho under an uh, agreement with the state that is temporary. We don't have a long-term mechanism for dealing with that waste other than the storage that would take place at Yucca Mountain and that spent fuel must go to a repository. In addition, this repository is one of the more important components in the process which we have developed to comply with our end of the nuclear proliferation 
agreements we've reached with the Russian Federation for the disposition of weapons-grade plutonium. Without the repository, I think that program will be set back, if not stalled. There are certainly arguments in my judgment, as I've said many times, uh, that support this site for homeland security purposes, because I believe it makes sense. Prudence, I think, dictates trying to store uh, as much of our nuclear waste as we can in this isolated repository a thousand feet under the desert where we can consolidate waste uh, that is currently temporarily stored in a variety of places including decommissioned reactors around the country which no longer function but where waste remains. And of course there's an argument that's very compelling from an environmental cleanup point of view. Without the repository waste remains where it is in temporary locations in my judgment, uh, that is not in the best interest of the environment in those communities, especially those where we already have uh, the decommissioning of the facilities that generated the, the waste to begin with, uh, not to mention uh, the nuclear material that, is our, that are at Department of Energy sites, such as uh, Rocky Flats in Colorado, which ultimately need to have a final resting place. And so for all of those, I think, very strong national interest reasons, uh, the decision to move forward with this uh, is a very important one and the correct one. And I think it is important in, in summary, Mr. Chairman, just to put in perspective uh, the choice before this committee and before the Senate. It's the same choice the House had. To override the veto merely allows the Department of Energy to move forward and to seek a final objective evaluation of the work which we have done over the last 20 years by the experts at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as to the safety and suitability issues here for the development of this repository. A decision not to override ends the process entirely. It leaves the waste where it's at with the Congress retaining its responsibilities to deal with the waste but without a plan to do so. And the problem with that is I think quite obvious on its face. But there's also another factor. And that is that, that this waste isn't going to just sit where it's at if Congress decides to terminate the Yucca Mountain project. Instead, what we'll have, Mr. Chairman, is a variety, I think, of makeshift ad hoc alternatives seized upon by people in communities who do not want the waste to remain where it's at, who've already been paying into our funds to have it dealt with and removed. And so, as we've already seen, you'll see such activities as, the, as, as efforts to create new storage facilities at alternative sites around the country. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission already has a request, a license request before it, from the Goshute Indian Tribe in Utah, who in consortium with some energy companies are offering uh, their reservation land as a storage site. Whether that license is granted or not, others will be and we'll begin to see the waste move. But it won't move through the coordinated plan that we have. It won't move under the federal government's oversight in the way that we propose. It won't go to a single repository. It will end up in a variety of locations under a variety of different transportation processes, in my judgment, in a very uncoordinated way and in a fashion that I don't think really reflects the best interests uh, of, of the nation from any of a variety of perspectives. And so for all of those reasons, because the science is sound, because we have been able to demonstrate, I think, clearly that both in a pre- and post-closure period, uh, the site is suitable and safe, because we have met those standards, and because of the compelling national interests, as well as the likelihood that in the, in the, in the absence of moving forward, we would find a variety of makeshift, undesirable alternatives, that the case is strong for at least allowing this process to go to the next stage and let the Nuclear Regulatory Commission make a final decision. I thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll <clears throat> go back and forth on questions and, and do it on, in the order that people arrived. Uh, one of the issues that's been uh, raised, Secretary Abraham, on this is that uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act requires you to file an application for a construction authorization with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission within 90 days after the President's site recommendation becomes effective if the Congress makes, accepts your recommendation and, and overrules uh, the governor. Uh, GAO has said that uh, you will not be able 
to file a license application for another four years rather than 90 days. <coughs> so assuming the joint resolution is signed into law, uh, are you prepared to file an application within 90 days? If not, what, uh, what happens if you, if you don't meet that deadline? Well, I do not believe uh, that the actions which were required for, by me to take before reaching a recommendation required us to have a completed or near completed license application. In fact, I think to argue that somehow the 90-day rule was uh, designed in some fashion to stop the process rather than to expedite it would be to turn it on its head. I think the 90 days was designed to try to make sure the process could move, could move forward quickly. Uh, when Congress um, enacted the uh, Waste Policy Act in 1982, it included in the act a lot of deadlines, uh, which represented its best judgment then of how the various steps could be taken. Uh, these deadlines included this 90-day provision. They also, of course, included the requirement that we begin accepting waste in 1998, which we have not done. Uh, but I think the time frames in the Act have proven to be optimistic for on, on their face, and I don't think that's any reason uh, for the Department not to honor what was, play, I, I think, plainly the central objective here, which was to, to try to move this along as promptly as possible. Now, the specific answer to your question is we believe that uh, we will be in a position to provide a license application by the end of the year 2004. Uh, we are moving forward to prepare that at this time. And I would note that the Congress has constrained uh, in appropriations the work that might be done by us on the license preparation side of our responsibilities and instead been funding uh, very explicitly programs on the site suitability side of our responsibility. But I do not believe that uh, the 90-day uh, uh, time frame here is in any way a uh, prohibition on us uh, moving forward to seek a license at a date uh, beyond 90 days after the finish of this process. One of the uh, one of the arguments the governor's used is uh, he says that the poor geology there at Yucca Mountain has forced the department to abandon reliance on the mountain's geology as a way to isolate the waste and instead uh, in his view the department is now relying on what the governor calls a series of fancy engineered waste packages and a tangled web of man-made contrivances. To what extent uh, will the repository rely on the geology of the, of the mountain and to what extent will it rely on waste packages or drip shields or other man-made barriers to ensure that the waste remains sealed in this repository. Mr. Chairman, the um, legislation that covers this issue has never uh, in, in any sense suggested that either a 100 percent geological uh, approach or a 100 percent man-made approach is called for. I think it always contemplated a combination and that is what we are proposing. Yucca Mountain has many positive attributes because of its location and its composition. There's low rainfall, obviously it sits near Death Valley. It has a closed groundwater basin which contributes mightily to uh, the safety features. Uh, it's in a, there's a, it's a benign environment for waste packages. It's isolated from population. And the result of all that is that its natural barriers alone are going to protect public health and safety by isolating 99.9999999% of the radioactive material which are placed in it over 10,000 years. Uh, those natural barriers alone would reduce exposure to, just to put this in perspective, 20% of the level of exposure which is currently allowable for U.S. nuclear workers. In short, it brings just by its geological factors alone, it brings uh, the potential exposure uh, below that which we have legally permitted to be the case for nuclear workers. It is still at that point higher than the EPA standards which are extraordinarily strict, which is why based on uh, those standards we have added additional engineering barriers uh, to accomplish the final small ingredient of protection that, uh, that I referenced earlier. One of the uh concerns that's been raised. This Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board that we're going to hear from next week, 
As said, the technical basis for the department's performance estimates is, quote, weak to moderate. Uh, I guess I would ask whether you share the board's assessment in that regard, uh, and why, uh, if you do, why the department's technical basis is not stronger. Well, first let me say that the tech we take the technical review board's comments and advice uh, seriously. Uh, we have throughout this process, uh, uh, they have a different responsibility than we do. Uh, their, their recommendations don't go specifically to meeting uh, the EPA targets or the nuclear regulatory targets only. Uh, rather, I think they've tried to offer perspectives on how to perfect the design of all of the various components uh, to an even higher standard, and we would like to do that as well. Let me just start by saying that there's no disagreement, I don't think, by, by as I said in my comments, but between us and the Technical Review Board or anyone over the safety and suitability of the facility in the first 300 years, where there has been some concerns raised by the board relates to that post-closure 10,000-year period thereafter. Uh, they have identified some issues which they, it, well, let me put it this way, we have, we have come up with what we believe are is a basic design approach that will meet these extraordinarily stringent standards. Question is, can we perfect them? And, and I think the review board has asked us, and I think the comments you referenced, go to the question of whether or not we have done enough research to even perfect them further. For example, one of the main areas that they've made recommendations on, which I think a lot of the, the reference point you made before uh, pertains to, is the question of whether or not the repository would be maintained in a hot versus a cold environment. And I think the review board believes more research needs to be done uh, to make a determination as to which is preferable in terms of what could make it even safer than the standard that we can meet. And we are conducting that research uh, as, as, as a matter of following up on their recommendations. So I think that the basis is for, for the conclusion we made as to suitability is strong. I think the issues that they raise are important ones to look at over the period of time we have ahead to perfect the design even better. One other question I wanted to ask uh, relates to the transportation. A lot of the complaint about this uh, proposal that you've, uh, you're, you're advocating uh, to use Yucca Mountain is that the transportation of the waste to this uh, site uh, will not be safe and will create a series of ha uh, new and un unnecessary hazards. Uh, I'd like your reaction to that and also any uh, estimates you could give us if, if Congress were to approve going ahead, as you are requesting, when is the earliest that shipments would actually be made to Yucca Mountain? Well, let me begin by talking about the safety record we've already achieved. Uh, in this country, uh, as well as in Europe, uh, literally, as cumulatively, as much nuclear waste as is contemplated being moved to Yucca Mountain has been moved over the last 30 years uh, without any harmful uh, radiation exposure. Uh, the track record is an impressive one. I think the chairman's familiar with the many protocols that were established, for example, in the movement of waste to the WIP facility at Carlsbad, and the same kind of an approach would be taken here. But the point is, we move a lot of waste today, and we have done it safely. Uh, moreover, uh, just to put some numbers on, 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 the, uh, on the record, uh, we move about 300 million uh, hazardous waste uh, shipments per year in this country. Three million of them involve some form of radiological material, and we do it safely. Not just our department, but the, the, uh, the transportation uh, sector and the other government agencies. So we can do this safely, uh, number one. Number two, uh, as I mentioned in my comments, this is not a situation that is unique to Yucca Mountain. If we don't go ahead with this program, if it were to be terminated now, as I said, there already are ad hoc makeshift alternatives being contemplated by people who have too much waste building up in their temporary storage facilities at nuclear reactors around the country. And whether it's done, the question is going to be not is there or isn't there transportation, there will be. The question I think for everybody to consider is whether it makes more sense to do it in a centralized, highly securitized, effective fashion, or to leave it to a variety of, of alternatives that will be different for each uh, 
new approach that ultimately is developed by people who have the waste in temporary facilities that they don't wish to retain in those locations. So it can be done. The time frame that you asked about uh, looks something like this. We believe, as I said before, that uh, we can proceed to a final application uh, by the end of the year 2004. We believe that process from there, there forward will, will be through the year 2006 to, to, into 2007 when we believe a license decision could be made. After that, it would take at least three years uh, to construct the facility and make it capable of accepting waste. So it's eight years roughly from now uh, when we would envision our time frame for the first uh, potential receipt of waste, 2010. Thank you very much. Senator Campbell. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, no scientific background whatsoever. They say uh, most of our decisions are really made by our own personal frame of reference. So let me try and do that as a, maybe as a senator who represents Colorado, but as a private citizen too. And I might say that I'm happy to see uh, our old colleague here, Secretary Ab Abraham. We don't get to see him uh, much anymore with his new job. Um, I don't know how many on the panel have actually witnessed the, 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 the awesome power of nuclear fission maybe with the exception of Senator Inns and Reed, because they're from Nevada, uh, but I have. And I know that this is a little different subject, but it has certainly set something in my frame of reference that I keep thinking about. In 1952 and 53, I was um, stationed at Nellis Air Force Base, which is just out of Las Vegas, as you know, Mr. Secretary, 90 miles from, about 90 miles from the location where we're talking about storing this um, waste, and had the opportunity to witness four at least four, and as I remember more than that, four bombs that were set off. Uh, three of them were from the base. In the middle of the night, it was so bright that you could actually read a newspaper without any lights at all for probably a couple of minutes before that brightness died down. Once I was what was called a perimeter guard, since I was an MP, uh, I think from about, about six miles away from it was set off, with very little uh, protection, we watched it with using a, a smoked glass, if you can imagine that. To this day, I wonder, and I hope I'm not, I don't mean to say this as an alarmist, but I, I wonder about um, the effects that uh, being close to those things had on the American people that were there, the military guys that were there at the time. I understand, although I have no, um, no absolute um, uh, documentation about this, there are still places in Yucca Flats where you can't go without some protective clothing because of those, those uh, bombs that were set off uh, above ground. Well, that's one of my concerns, and I always kind of factor that in that I saw those things, and I know other people probably have too. But one of my other big concerns that I think you talked about somewhat still doesn't satisfy me, though, is the transportation. As I understand it, the governors have, do not have the right to veto the route that these shipments come through this or state. You mentioned about 175 shipments a year. I don't know how many the total amount is. I guess thousands and thousands over a period of years. But the main route for east-west for Colorado is I-70 right through downtown Denver, which has about 2 million people in the metropolitan area, and a governor that can't veto that. Um, it then goes over I-70, Vail Pass. Maybe you've been that way and down what is called Glenwood Canyon. Glenwood Canyon is a major east-west artery, but a very narrow canyon, and most of the tributaries that go into the river beside the Glenwood uh, the highway and by the way, the train track also goes there, so you have the same problem with trains or highway. Most of that water feeds into the Colorado, which then in turn goes to Nevada, to California, uh, to lower Colorado, to Mexico, and I guess to, in some cases, to Arizona too. I checked with our Department of Transportation yesterday. They told me that in 1993, the semis, the, the heavy trucks, the big trucks, there were 19 wrecks on that road in 93, 16 in 94, 20 in 95, 14 in 96, 15 in 97, 19 in 98, 11 in 99, 12 in the year 2000, and I don't have any figures for this last year. So there's no question, trucks are crashing all the time. Of those, 75% of the accidents occurred during the daytime, and 75% of them were involved with collisions with other vehicles. Well, I don't blame the governor of South Carolina, by the way, who has literally said he'll call out the guard to throw his body down in front of the trucks if anybody tries to ship any 
any uh, nuclear waste into his state. I understand that. Our governor in Colorado, Governor Owens, just recently put a moratorium on some shipment of low-level waste that was supposed to be imported by a company that was going to reprocess it in Canyon City, Colorado. I would think if a governor doesn't do that, or the senators too don't oppose that, they, they don't stay in office the next time around because that's the way uh, people feel. But I often um, get criticized in my own state because of my position on it, but every state gained the job base and all the benefits from producing this stuff. Every one of them. They got the jobs, they got the tax base, they got all the good. And sometimes I liken it to the guy that builds a nice home but forgot to factor in the septic tank. And so after he gets his nice home built, he wants to put the septic tank on his neighbor's land. I just think that's morally wrong. I, I've, I've been involved with this, I guess, as much as on anybody in this committee, having been on it since I've been in the, U in the U.S. Senate, and I think I've heard all the scientific reasons why we ought to do it, and maybe there are some. I just think that there's a moral obligation, too, and I'm not at all sure we ought to be dumping it in, in, in Nevada. But I just wanted to pass it on to you. I really don't have any questions, Mr. Chairman, but I wanted to get that off my chest. Thank you. If I could just comment, Mr. Chairman. First, I would note that notwithstanding the challenge we're having with uh, regard to South Carolina, the governor of South Carolina is a strong and proponent of uh, this process and endorses uh, the decision to go forward with Yucca Mountain. But not in his state. I would also, I would also right. note that, uh, that uh, as you are well aware, Senator, the state now, the, of the Colorado governor of Nevada anxious. also favors the shipments to South Carolina. I might also add, it's so the NIMBY system. I understand So does that. Colorado. Because so does Colorado. Well, I get criticized and, for And your governor and colleagues who wish us to ship the material from Rocky Flats to South Carolina. So obviously this is an ongoing challenge. But I do want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, the states uh, are uh, permitted uh, under the rules which we have to, um, uh, after we, uh, uh, if the site is designated, we will identify preliminary routes. We will consult with states and tribes through which routes would be used. Um, and the states have uh, the option, uh, as we saw with the WIP shipments, to uh, provide, uh, prefer, preferred shipping routes instead through their jurisdictions, which they can designate, which we will follow. I'd also just add that... Well, then something's changed, Mr. Secretary, because the last time we dealt with this bill, as I read the bill, it said that the governors could uh, designate routes and they could recommend routes, but in fact, the DOE had the authority to, uh, to veto that, not to go along with it. And the since they're in, the in Colorado, I don't know about some of the other states, but there is no east-west route except I-70 that's a four-lane highway. The rest of them are all two-lane country roads. That's not true. The, no, the process, as I understand it, Senator, includes so notification of both the, Colorado. the governors as well as the Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission, uh, escort training uh, for those who would be engaged in the management and, and transfer, uh, that is the local personnel. Advanced arrangements will be made with law enforcement agencies along the route. Advanced route approval is required by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, at least uh, one escort uh, uh, to maintain visual surveillance of the shipment, status reports uh, uh, every two hours. There's a variety of, of those additional protections. Yes. We've done this and with I, And I understand and that, in it. fact, and I uh, appreciate that. And in fact, to some of that, those things, including driver training and um, you know, funds for local hazmat teams and so on was put in because of us that uh, some of us that uh, were not very supportive of the last few years of this movement without additional precautions. Is so this, I think that's all to the good. As, as I said, I mean, and I think I think it's to the good as well. I also would again just reference two things. Number one, I believe you're going to have transportation and shipments, whether it's done by this process or by alternatives that are are developed by companies uh, who find people willing to store this off-site. And again, all I can say is we've, we've had, I think, uh, over the last 30 years, a track record both with respect to this kind of material as well as our WIP program that is uh, unblemished. And, and we're, we're proud of the fact that there have been no harmful uh, radiation exposures both here as well as in Europe, uh, despite a huge amount of, of transport. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just the last comment, I would recommend that maybe we study shipping it to Michigan. There's no uh, response to that. There's Let no me response uh, to that. call on Senator <laughs> Landrieu. I noticed. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just thank you for your leadership, Mr. Secretary, on this very difficult issue and helping us 
<clears throat> to work through it and to try to provide a plan that's really uh, good for this country, respectful of all of our states, and continues to move us uh, in a very progressive and positive direction to strengthen um, our economy and to continue to, uh, to march forward. Let me just ask two questions, and then I'm going to make just a general comment. You alluded to this, but I think one of the issues uh, that's raised by opponents is this transportation issue. And so I'd like to go over again, if you could uh, put a little bit more on the record about the safe transportation of waste from the National Weapons Complex to New Mexico. You referred, alluded to the WIP program. Could you go over again the results of that um, transportation? Because as you can well, see, it's, it's been raised as a right. concern, and, and but I think it's an important point to reiterate. No, and, and, it, and it is, and I recognize, as I've said, the concerns people have. <coughs> we believe the alternative, just as a a preliminary point, it's not the case that failure to go forward with this means no transportation. The question is, who do you think can do it better? The people who have done it for 30 years without a harmful radiation exposure or others. Uh, but we have a successful program shipping for WIP, um, uh, which has resulted in the safe movement of about 20 percent of, of the shipment trip volume anticipated for Yucca Mountain already. Uh, and and we, we support, actually, the consideration of, of using the same kinds of protocols here uh, that, or, or something similar to, uh, as a starting point to d design the system we'd use for Yucca Mountain. Now, just, just to put that in perspective, with WIP, we, uh, we've provided assistance with first responder capacity uh, and capability through training and other assistance. Uh, over 20,000 first responders have been trained. We've worked with states to establish shipping routes and protocols such as time of day, the weather, and other restrictions. A notification of the states uh, of all shipments and provision for feedback on modifying the time of day shipment at the release point. Uh, state patrol safety inspections uh, and DOE radiation inspection of shipping vehicles. Uh, and, radi and, and, and rigorous inspections done prior to the release uh, during the trip as well as at the release. Satellite tracking uh, of uh, in route vehicles, all of these and, and more are part of the protocols of WIP that have been very effective. Uh, we would envision starting uh, with that as a, a uh, menu uh, to choose from as we would we would consider a similar approach at, at Yucca Mountain. Well, the reason I raise this, Mr. Chairman, I think in this debate it's very, very important for us to understand that while there might be risk associated with the moving of this material, the Secretary has outlined all of the extraordinary precautions that can and will be taken and have been taken with minimal, if, you know, effect, and that can be taken. But what people have to realize is that right now there is either even a larger risk of 131 sites with this nuclear stored material that are also in populated areas, in some cases right next door to neighborhoods, very populated neighborhoods. This isn't just a matter of now energy, you know, security and a mix of fuels and the importance of nuclear. It's a security issue. With post, you know, 911, there are possibilities that we won't discuss in detail, but people could imagine. Um, you know, attacks on some of these storage sites, they're in populated areas now. So, you know, one of the quotes that I have in my statement is a quote from, you know, from uh, George Patton, which basically says, don't let, um, let me get it right here, a good battle plan that we act on today can be better than a perfect one tomorrow. I suggest we have a good battle plan, that we need to act on it. And the argument that it is risky to move it is more risky than leaving it where it is, I don't think the science or the evidence uh, or common sense uh, bakes, makes, you know, ba backs up that second argument. We have 131 sites in all over the country, primarily in the northeast and west, not so much in the, uh, the western states, but you can see the grid here of where these sites are, and it's dangerous. And so the plan that you've outlined, I just want to say, I think reduces risk, uh, bolsters our energy security through promoting uh, this um, uh, nuclear uh, renaissance, as well as uh, answering a real immediate threat to our national security today. Now, my second question is, um, this report that has caused a lot of 
consternation which has come out about technical defects in the plan. I understand that it was looking at sort of the next 50 years, 50 to 300 years. There were 293 technical items identified in this report. My question is, are there any potential showstoppers that you see in those 193, or how would you describe them to us? Are these things that we should be no, very no. concerned about? Are they technical in nature? And could you give us a little of your uh, feedback on Senator, that? Senator, you're referring, I think, to the 293 technical studies or, or work that, that must be done uh, prior to uh, finishing the license application preparation process. Some have tried to characterize these as defects. They're not. Rather, they, they really are checklist items which have been agreed to by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy um, as, as steps that remain to be done before uh, the application is finished. I, I don't want <clears throat> to draw a direct comparison, but we've all at different points in our life participated in applying for things, uh, whether it's uh, admission to college or graduate school or it's uh, other similar items, there's a lot of things that you have to provide. They aren't automatically in the hands of the people to whom the application must go. It's re the responsibility of the preparer to compile those. And we believe that, uh, that we're in a position to do that. First of all, the 293 number, which came out some time ago, has already been substantially reduced. Uh, 41 of the agreements are now completed to the satisfaction of the NRC, which means the, the number is now 252. Uh, we believe by September 30th of this year, a full third of these will be done, uh, bringing the number down to about 200. Uh, and we are confident that the remainder are going to be addressed by December 2004 when we expect to submit the license. 53% uh, of all of these relate to just simply providing documentation that already exists or is in a period process of being revised to be appropriate for submission. And so, these aren't showstoppers. These are technical steps that need to be taken on the way to licensing. And just to put one last point on the on the record here, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has provided us with a sufficiency letter, uh, the kind of document that indicates uh, that uh, uh, they believe we have met already the sorts of standards that would cause us to move towards this licensing process. Uh, they stated that existing and planned work upon completion would be sufficient for inclusion in a repository license application. Uh, we wouldn't, I, I mean, the choice we would have is the argument to somehow do all of this work uh, before we'd even submit a license is simply not contemplated in the statute, and it's, it's part of the process. Actually, it's quite a bit more, I think, in terms of preparation already than the, the preparation that's done for the, the normal licensing of a facility. Mr. Chairman, let me just close with just, um, you know, one minute summary. I think the evidence um, and the testimony suggests that there have been very rigorous scientific and peer review studies that indicate that this is potentially at least the best site that, you know, we should, the best site in the United States today. The people in Louisiana have already paid $253 million in through um, additions to utility bills to build and invest in this site. Number three, it's not just the nuclear energy industry that's at stake in its future, but it's the security of this nation. Again, in Louisiana, we have three sites. I'd cite to the senator from Kentucky. We have two, but right across the line in Mississippi, we say our sister state. There are three sites. These are very dangerous sites. Um, it, there's nothing to say that a terrorist couldn't slam a mortar shell or crash a small plane into one of the 131, which are the three I've just cited. Um, forget trying to sabotage a nuclear facility. It's these dangerous sites. This material is all over the nation. I would say that it is in our security to try to move it to a very secure place environmentally and otherwise. And the faster we get about doing it, I think the better. And um, I just wanted to add that to the record. I am very sensitive to any environmental considerations, but there are compelling national security reasons as well as um, energy security reasons why we should move this process forward. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hagel. <coughs> Chairman, thank you. Mr. Secretary, um, we appreciate you being here this morning, and thanks for your leadership and uh, that of your colleagues over at the Department of Energy. Uh, the, these are um, elusive issues that we deal with. And I, um, uh, 
would build on to what my colleagues from Louisiana and Colorado have noted and add uh, one additional ob observation. Uh, we, we don't live in a risk-free society. Uh, if, in fact, we have the expectations and standards and values that uh, we do, that we think are important in this country, uh, to grow our economy and provide opportunities in a more just and better world for not just America but for all of the world, uh, then that requires that requires some risk. Uh, none of us today, I suspect, uh, certainly I don't believe the Secretary is uh, stating this or implying this, that he can unequivocally state that there is no risk uh, in the transportation of uh, radioactive materials uh, or in any other part dynamic of this equation. Uh, that is as it is. And I suppose we could go back to the time uh, of the loincloth and spears and, and find a, a, a less risk in society. I also note uh, uh, what my colleague from Colorado said uh, about the moral decision here. Well, I, I would ask uh, the next question, uh, is it more moral to defer this decision? Uh, as essentially uh, uh, we continue to do and leave it to the next generation. Uh, does the world get safer? Is there less risk in 20 years? I don't think so. Uh, the fact is we must step up to this tough, difficult uh, decision, and I think uh, the 20 <coughs> years of a very intense scientific study that's gone into this uh, uh, is as sophisticated and complete as any other project in the history of this country. And the Secretary has noted uh, some of the other projects that were rather significant to the future of mankind uh, that took far less time uh, in achieving an objective than when we are today. When my uh, friend and colleague from Nevada, Senator Ensign, came to see me the other day, he, he brought up a good point, and I want to ask this question based on on Senator Ensign's uh, question to me and point he made about the development of alternative spent fuel management strategies, which you are familiar with, Mr. Secretary. I'm speaking specifically of the reprocessing and, and transmutation technology that is uh, ongoing, developing, and I understand that the uh, Energy Department has put more money back into the budget, which originally my understanding was that it had been zeroed out for this. Uh, and the senator from Nevada makes, uh, I think, a, a, good, a good point. Uh, why not wait until uh, this is developed further, and therefore uh, we would minimize uh, the risk of moving certainly the intensity of the radioactivity uh, of the material? And that's a question I have for you. And the second question, Mr. Secretary, is uh, what are the consequences? Uh, if, in fact, this body, the United States Senate, would further delay this decision uh, by sustaining the Nevada governor's uh, veto. Two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The, fir the first question is this. Obviously, uh, the Department of Energy engages in research on new technologies and uh, uh, possible alternative ways to, uh, uh, to deal with nuclear waste, transmutation being one of the issues that uh, has had a lot of attention lately. Uh, but the challenge we have is this, that all of the alternative processes which we can foresee today uh, create byproducts themselves uh, that still require disposal some way, somehow, uh, in a repository, in our judgment, to ensure the protection of public health and safety. So that's the, that's the, the, the challenge, and, and I won't even get into issues of cost as well as uncertainty. Uh, as far as the decision not to move ahead, as I've said here before, there's, there's a variety of implications on national security, on the environment, uh, on uh, uh, energy security that are quite clear. I believe that uh, uh, deciding to uh, at least not move to the point of allowing a licensing process to occur uh, and for the consideration by, by the NRC. Uh, brings to a halt uh, any uh, immediate uh, issue as to uh, dealing with nuclear waste. 
that will have an implication, I think, on investment in and the potential for nuclear energy to remain a 20 percent provider of fuel for electricity generation. That has a lot of implications in terms of how we might alternatively provide that level of, of electricity generation. Second, it has an implication on the issue of of national security. As I mentioned, our naval reactors program is dependent upon ultimately being able to dispose of the waste from the from the propulsion systems. Right now, the state of Idaho is under uh, a temporary agreement providing a, a location for that, but the state of Idaho expected that we would dispose of that at some point in this fashion. And I think that uh, it's hard to tell what would be the continuity of that program. I mentioned the non-proliferation programs, which are directly affected by uh, our ability to uh, to both uh, dispose of plutonium through the, the, the con conversion of it to MOX, and then that creates a byproduct that has to go somewhere. And we've already, as we've discussed before, found the governor of South Carolina, people of that state very concerned about having a pathway out of South Carolina for the byproducts of the plutonium disposition that we might conduct there. So there's all of those factors, as well as the, the issue I've raised before, and that is I think people uh, will engage in their own self-help efforts. Right now, the waste is at 131 sites. A lot of them are near major cities on important waterways, and the communities that, that are, are affected directly don't want the waste to stay there, and they thought they'd been paying all this money into our uh, federal treasury to get it out of there by 19, beginning in 1998. That hasn't happened. It will at least be 12 years late. So I do think you're going to have alternatives develop of the sort that already have begun. And I don't think that's either the most prudent or safe way to, do, to deal with it. So I think those are the kinds of implications. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Senator Craig. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, when uh, the decision that you proposed to the President uh, came about, I was uh, making an effort to uh, contact you for a variety of other reasons, and I know that you sequestered yourself and spent a good deal of time studying this issue. While you had had exposure to it uh, as a senator, I don't think you had had the need to understand it in the depth that you've gained, and I appreciate that a great deal. I say that as somebody who uh, does know a bit about it and uh, has dealt with this issue uh, in a positive and negative sense for a long time. And I don't mean just yuck them out, and I mean spent fuel and waste and materials. And um, while I am not cavalier at all about nuclear waste, high-level waste, I think you develop a level of pragmatism because you understand the extreme measures this country has gone to historically to protect uh, human safety once we got through the learning curve in the very early days and therefore built in extraordinary ways uh, the materials, the equipment, the shields, uh, and uh, uh, the containers in which uh, high-level waste is trafficked. Uh, and as a result of that, we have, as you've noted, a phenomenal record of uh, safety. Um, just recently in my colleague's state of Wyoming, a truck left the road because of a windstorm. Uh, and it had waste on it. And uh, they picked it up and put it back on the truck and left. Uh, why? Because the integrity of the containers were so substantial that there was no problem. Uh, and uh, while none of us like to see that, the reality is now with the two-pack situation that we're moving transuranic waste out of Idaho to uh, Carlsbad, uh, it is an, a phenomenal track record. And I invite my colleagues to come and see it and to understand it and to l watch the GPS trafficking and to know where those trucks are at every moment of their movement uh, is something that is to be seen and understood, not feared. Because if the public knew of the amount of trafficking of high-level waste today around the country, I don't know that they would be alarmed. I think they would be very surprised to find out that this has gone on for decades in phenomenally safe and secure ways. My colleague from Colorado has a right to be concerned. Uh, we've moved a good deal of waste out of his state to Idaho and other places over the last good number of years. Ironically, now that we're using TruPack, we're not saddling it all up in 50-gallon drums and throwing tarps over it and wrapping uh, bungee cords around it and heading out. And that's how a good deal of waste left his state over the years. 
but we do that much differently today uh, than we have in the past. Uh, and uh, we understand the concern of the public, and rightfully so, and I think that's responsible. Uh, well, I'll, when the chairman gets back, I have some uh, articles out of Science Magazine that I'll ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, for the record. They become a part of the record. Senator Mikowski um, <coughs> has uh, uh, asked that they become a part of the record. They'll, they'll be included in the record. Um, Many of us have been to the WHIP facility at Carlsbad. We know that that is low-level transuranic waste, uh, you know, a perfect example of, of, uh, uh, of, of what has gone on. And I now give this information to my colleague from Colorado because it is very important that we understand the scope and the magnitude of what we're dealing with here. But Rocky Flat Environmental Technological Site, we've moved to 499 shipments, and that's 3, 395,412 road miles uh, from Colorado out to uh, New Mexico, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, uh, not one incident. Uh, and that's because of the great concern that we have today about how these issues get handled. To deal with a high-level waste uh, issue and to deal with a permanent repository that takes us down the road further, remember, as I've said in my testimony, and you've said so clearly, Mr. Secretary, this is the next step in a licensing process. We're passing judgment on your findings to see if we can move at the next step. If we don't go to the next step, and if we do not develop a repository, uh, you've spoken some to the environmental management program uh, at DOE and how we handle uh, INEEL waste in Yucca Mountain, or uh, Hanford, uh, uh, and of course we have the Savannah River issues. Where do we go from here? if we don't go where we appear to be headed at the moment? Well, I can't answer that question because uh, it's, it's the case that the statutes bring this process to an end if Congress were to not act to override the veto of uh, the state of Nevada. And so it would be left, I think, for the executive branch and the legislative branch to have to begin at square one trying to decide if there's some other process, approach, uh, et cetera, that could be used. Uh, given the duration that's been involved in getting to this point, I don't expect, uh, I wouldn't at least uh, anticipate that that resolution would happen very swiftly. Uh, but all of the implications I mentioned uh, in commenting on, on this to Senator Hagel would, of course, uh, come into, uh, uh, into play. Uh, failure to override just simply ends the Yucca Mountain project. It does not, however, eliminate the, governor, the government's responsibility under the Waste Policy Acts uh, to accept uh, statutory responsibility for the waste. And so it isn't a situation where people will be essentially left to fend for themselves. It means that we would have to determine what the government will do uh, in the face of having collected, obviously, uh, billions of dollars uh, for the purpose of, of uh, the uh, disposition of this waste. Well, many of the questions I have have been alluded to or responded to in some form. Let me move to uh, a concern that my colleague from Nevada has, and it's right, rightfully so, to, for him to express and, and, and question why we can't do something else. In light of the current level of high-level materials that are out there now that would ultimately seek uh, final disposition at Yucca Mountain, both commercial and private, or, and public, and the ongoing uh, generation of waste at this time, we've not just accumulated a volume and stopped. We have an ongoing process here of waste accumulation because of that 20-plus percent uh, of our energy basket that's generated by nuclear and an anticipation, right. and a hope on my part and a good many others, that in a cleaner environment and a concern on climate change and all that, we're going to have a new reactor design and new concepts out there that will generate high-level waste. Um, is it not true that while we search for new technologies and, and ways of applying it, and you're correct to say waste streams occur, uh, as a result of these new technologies or applications uh, to reduce the overall waste. And if we create reactors that burn more efficiently and therefore leave less waste or less materials to be processed, while we may diminish the waste stream, uh, a waste stream will be there. Uh, and with the volume we have now, uh, it, it's, it's at least my reaction, and see if I'm not right, Mr. Uh, Secretary, that 
with the volume we have now and, and the intent that a, a large portion of that will go to Yucca Mountain, there is still clearly a need to do what the, uh, what the Senator of Nevada is doing so that another Yucca Mountain or another repository at some time in the future will certainly, we, we need to lessen the need for that uh, by new applications. Well, it's hard to prophesize what new technologies mm -hmm. could be. Uh, we have a waste disposition problem before us today. Uh, I don't see a uh, transition to the kind of alternatives anybody's talked about in the near future because of a variety of issues. That, I mean, we haven't built a new nuclear facility in this country in about 30 years, so the notion that we would engage in the construction of uh, an as yet developed scientific uh, uh, alternative, uh, whether it's a reprocessing or transmutation uh, system uh, in the, anywhere in the foreseeable future, to me, is, is extraordinarily unlikely. Uh, clearly, even if we do, as I mentioned before, though, there will be waste as a byproduct of that. And so it still calls for the need to, I think, move forward. Um, and again, uh, the speculation that has taken place over a long period of time uh, on, on alternatives has yet to yield one that I think this country is e even remotely close to considering uh, or that science is close to uh, uh, endorsing at a level that comes even near the kind of safety endorsement that I believe we can provide here. Last question, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your tolerance. We have on a table before us a model of a fuel assembly. Uh, I think a lot of folks have been uh, sitting out there saying, what, what, what's that sitting there? Uh, that's what would be transported to Yucca Mountain and stored. Um, and I think it, there are myths and there are realities. There are illusions and there are facts as it relates to this issue. Um, those would be transported in containers uh, and then, of course, the container that is being developed now, um, uh, which would be uh, considerably more substantial to meet these 10,000-year tests are such. But I think what is important for me to understand uh, is that items like that don't go boom. Items like this do not explode. They radiate. Um, they have some heat. But they don't go critical. And we understand that, and the scientists understand that. Uh, and that is what is important as we deal with these issues. These kinds of items transported, even if a truck were le to leave the road, and they remained in their container and they were jostled around, don't go critical, meaning explode. Because that is the character of them. And it is important, I think, for us to understand that. Isn't that your understanding, Mr. Secretary? And well, that is what we're looking at here in this item? Obviously, in the environmental impact statement and of every one of the scientific uh, uh, processes that have already been uh, engaged in, uh, because we have moved the exact type of thing that we're, we're proposing to move to Yucca Mountain in the past, evaluations of the safety have been extensive, and you're correct in the uh, conclusion. We're, our, the, the issue of, of harmful uh, radiation exposure is, is one that, that we take at the highest, most serious level. But, uh, but we have an unblemished 30-year track record of, of uh, being able to move that, and um, the issue is not one of, of explosions of this material. It's in a different state. Uh, but we don't just consider that. We also consider whether or not we can package this in a fashion that protects the public from any kind of exposure should there be any kind of, uh, of uh, incident. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think uh, you covered this very well and I appreciate it. I'll be rather quick. There's a number of well, first of all, it's my understanding that the South Carolina concern was not so much on transportation as it was simply on the timely processing issue. Right. And transportation really wasn't the issue in South right. Carolina. Right. No, the state of South Carolina's concerns have been whether or not there was a pathway uh, for the materials uh, to that came into the state to leave. Right. And the commitment of 
both Congress as well as the executive branch to making sure the things that we indicated would happen in terms of building facilities to dispose of the, of the plutonium would happen. I have heard, of course, and I understand the concern, uh, some of the Nevada concerns. One has said they haven't had an opportunity to be heard. How do you react to that? I'm sorry? How does Nevada sometimes indicates they haven't had the opportunity to be heard in this decision? Well, we conducted an extensive number of hearings. Uh, somewhere in here I think I have a total number, but um, as, a, as, as we moved ahead with this process, there have been a variety of, of stages in which public comment and public hearing uh, were uh, available. Uh, the, um, the total number of, of hearings that I think have been conducted, uh, we've had 198 days of comment periods. Uh, just on the site recommendation, we've had 66 hearings in Nevada over, over the four-month period in which we were uh, looking at this, 1,419 witnesses, 605 comments received. Uh, so there have been extensive public uh, opportunities for participation in the process just in this set of final stages, as well as participation in other stages as well as various uh, reports, uh, preliminary actions uh, were uh, subjected to public comment. I see. There's also an allegation that the siting guidelines were changed to make it possible for Yucca Mountain to meet them. How do you react to that? Well, I, I, I find this frustrating because the changes that took place were changes brought about because in 1992 Congress changed the way that this process should be conducted. It, it, it changed the standards that were to be applied the Environmental Protection Agency and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission responded to those changes in the, the, the 92 Act, uh, and we obviously had to change in response to that as well. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, a little bit frustrating because a lot of the, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the, the purpose of our changes was to make them consistent with the new congressionally uh, directed EPA standards and, and nuclear regulatory uh, regulations, and so uh, that's the reason. I, it is, the implication that this was done to somehow make this work just is wrong. It was be, because we uh, had to meet a different standard that was put in, in motion by Congress's actions in 1992. What, um, assuming we go forward, as I hope we will, uh, what is necessary now before you, for the department and administration makes a final site recommendation. Well, actually, that process has has occurred. We've made the recommendation. Uh, now it's Congress's decision whether or not to move this process ahead to licensing, which would be the next stage. Mm -hmm. And so, as I have said from the beginning, the the issue is: do we end the whole process now? Because that, in effect, is what happens if the Nevada veto stands, uh, or do we give? I mean, there's look. There's been Obviously, uh, we have two senators here from Nevada, and uh, they and others uh, have criticisms about the science. They've called into question a variety of issues, which will will have been debated at great length. Uh, there's two cases here. The case we make that this is, in fact, a suitable site uh, that will protect the safety and meet the standards, and the argument that it won't. And my view is uh, it would be in the interest of the American people to let the objective decision-making process of the licensing uh, of the facility by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission be a final decision. We believe, I strongly believe, the recommendation that the site is suitable is the correct one. Uh, but I am willing to subject that analysis uh, to the experts at the NRC. Uh, I hope the other side would view it the same way. If they think they're right, then this is uh, the appropriate venue in which to have an ultimate decision made. The, um, you know, some of the broad decisions, such as transportation, such as I've even heard that it would have an effect on the economy of Las Vegas and so on. This has been going on for 24 years, isn't that right? We spent four, over $4 billion so far. Well, I think that in 1987, uh, the specific decision to focus on the site in Nevada uh, was finalized by Congress. So, in essence, 15 years, for 15 years, the, the specific and only uh, work has been done towards uh, determining whether or not Yucca Mountain is suitable. I see. Well, I just, 
feel very strongly, as has already been expressed here, we have a problem, we have a situation, we have to find a solution. This appears to be the best solution before us. So thank you very much for your work, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, for the information of members, we should have a vote about 5 after 11. All right. <clears throat> Rather than 11.30. Okay. Uh, Senator Domenici. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. It's good to be with you again. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, I think you know that uh, I've been concerned uh, that we need to be doing research today to enable better utilization in the future of the large amount of uh, energy that remains behind as spent fuel. Uh, and furthermore, uh, technologies that would provide better energy recovery and also allow us to reduce the toxicity of final waste products. Since the existing power plants even if we add no more, we'll fill Yucca Mountain. We obviously need to better have better approaches to spent fuel management uh, a lot more than just uh, Yucca Mountains. I think we should be studying those better principles. This was strongly supported uh, in the President's national energy policy. I saw it there uh, as something he wanted to get done. But I was disappointed that the DOE budget request uh, for 2003 uh, effectively provided no resources uh, for the research projects on this topic even though they had been started last year by Congress. Can you discuss the uh, interest of the department and your thoughts on this particular approach to well, waste? Uh, you know, I've said before and, and uh, recently at, uh, in a speech uh, expressed uh, that the views in our an energy policy about the, the need for more research in this area remain in, intact. I don't think uh, that this sort of research, uh, and, and I think the budget was a reflection of, of the, the, the concern that, that it, it makes as much sense to invest this level of, um, of, of money in some of these programs uh, if, there, if we don't resolve this issue of, of Yucca Mountain first. Uh, because in my judgment, uh, if, if, if there's not much of a future for nuclear energy because we aren't going to deal with this waste, or if there's a decision in the other direction, uh, that should, I think, have some impact on, on the level of research that we would conduct. Uh, but I appreciate um, the concerns you and I have talked about before, and, and, and we, are not, uh, uh, we are not shutting the door on that type of research in the future. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, and, and these are just my last uh, observations, uh, I want to congratulate you on the efforts you've made in working with Russia in your short term as Secretary. It's clear uh, that they have a completely different view of nuclear power and spent fuel than we do. They actually think the spent fuel rods are, are the residue of the legacy of the Cold War, if there is one. And they think it's very valuable because they want to use it. So we, we're working with them because we want to get the, the waste products like plutonium and others out of the marketplace. And uh, I think we're going to succeed in doing some really major things in this area, and it will probably change the opinion of many people with reference to uh, nuclear waste and nuclear policy uh, once they get going uh, and we cooperate with them. So I commend you for that. And, uh, I also, on this one here, I commend you for your courage. It's time we move on, vote, decide what America's going to do about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Abraham, the changes about which you spoke in 1992 uh, related only to the NRC and EPA, not DOE. Are you aware of that? Well, the changes that were set in motion but, but directed... But answer, answer that question. Weren't, well, weren't they, they weren't directed toward the DOE. They were directed to the NRC and the EPA. Our need is to meet standards that are set by the NRC and the EPA. And so we are governed by what is the level of, of exposure and the nature uh, of, the, of the standards that we were called upon to, to test. I mean, the... Energy Policy Act directed the EPA to develop a site-specific standard, which changed the mechanism by which uh, we would be evaluated. And obviously, we had a change, therefore... The we, we have a vote coming up real soon, and 
you understand, having been a senator, we have to get over when the vote occurs. I remember, <clears throat> and, I remember and, actually waiting for witnesses to answer that sometimes yes. went too long, so I'll do my best to uh, keep and, that perspective as well. And I feel, Secretary Abraham, you know, I know of your um, academic background. You're a very smart man. You're a graduate of Harvard Law School. And I think um, one of the problems that I'm just speaking for myself is that we, we get answers just like the one you gave me, and you do that uh, very well. You don't answer the questions. And, and for example, uh, you talk about environmental need to move this waste to Yucca Mountain. I'm sure you're aware that there are 500 local environmental groups, 49 national environmental groups, all oppose everything that you're doing regarding nuclear waste. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that there are strong opinions on both sides of the issue, Senator, but in my judgment, leaving this waste in temporary storage facilities all over the country, and particularly at the sites in the Department of but Energy's you complex. You see, Secretary Abraham, all due respect, there's going to be stuff around in those sites anyway. You're not going to leave the stuff. It's going to be there. As you are aware, uh, they're going to continually generate nuclear waste. There are a few sites that are going to be set, set down. Of course, we read in the paper this morning there's a $2 billion project to try to start one up in, in uh, Tennessee. So those sites, uh, you know, uh, you realize that when you take one of those spent fuel rods out, you can't move that thing any place for at least five years. It has to stay in a cooling pond for five years. So those places are still going to be there. And to say, uh, again, with deep respect that I have for you and the office you hold, uh, there's not necessarily going to be this mass transportation that's going to take place anyway because you know that there are scientists who say leave it where it is in dry cast storage containers. I'm working with uh, Senators Clinton and Lieberman and others to make sure that those sites where we, gener where, where we generate nuclear waste but also generate nu nuclear power are safe. We have, we have real concerns. Uh, significant members of the Congress, House and Senate, about the safety of those facilities. And we believe that they can be made safer and that the leaving these containers where they are in either underground or above ground storage would be certainly safer than trying to move them around. And I also say, Ms. Secretary, you talked about the shipment of waste around Europe, nuclear waste. You, of course, are aware that in they've tried to move stuff in Europe on a number of occasions. People tie themselves to railroad tracks, chain themselves to railroad tracks. In fact, Germany have uh, just given up on it. The fact Germany has scrapped their nuclear waste repository program because they can't move the waste. That's that's a fact. Um, the Department of Energy has spent. Let me here now. I'll ask you a question rather than giving one of those senatorial speeches of which you're so familiar, uh, Mr. Secretary. The the and I want to make sure that. Senator Ensign has time for ask his questions. The Department of Energy has spent billions of dollars studying up Yucca Mountain. I've heard $4 billion around here today. I think it's closer to seven, as you're aware. How much uh, of that has been spent on transportation? You may not know the breakdown today, but would you get that back to us very quickly? I will, and I'd note that it was one of the major components of the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statements preparation. So I'll get that, that for the record. And I, I would also, in providing that number, if you would also provide us with any and all documents or memos produced by the DOE on the transportation of any kind of hazardous waste, I would really appreciate that too. That should be in some of the work that you've done. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Um, I, would, I would say, Ms. Secretary, that it's really not, and I think this is some of your Harvard logic, but we have to sort right through that. The fact that they've transported 3 million tons of hazardous wastes, waste has nothing to do with the transportation of nuclear waste. Nuclear waste, you, you know, hazardous substances, we know that that could be a, a gown that somebody wore uh, when they were doing an x-ray or having an x-ray taken. I mean, it's really minimal stuff. Hazardous waste has a very low threshold. Some of it is, is more dangerous than others when you get into some of the caustic acids and stuff that are hauled around. But you add all those together, the three million tons of, of uh, hazardous waste together, and uh, it wouldn't have nearly the punch of one truckload of nuclear waste. You know, they're, they're a group of scientists who have no dog in the fight said that one truckload of nuclear waste, that is spent fuel canisters, would have 240 times the radioactivity of the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. And we know that a shoulder-fired weapon will pierce one of those uh, 
canisters. So I just think your example about 3 million tons of hazardous, hazardous waste is not well taken. And I, I want to, we're, we're going to have a vote very shortly. And so if I could stop so Senator Anson would have some time. Uh, Senator Anson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I want to go back to this uh, because you've made a big deal of it in the press. I want to go back to this, you know, 131 sites versus one site. Uh, Senator Landrew had, had talked about that. Senator Craig, uh, you've talked about uh, uh, that it's going to go forward, and, you know, transportation is going to go forward no matter what. Uh, how many, when we start Yucca Mountain, when Yucca Mountain starts, what's the estimates that you have uh, as far as the number of tons of nuclear waste that will be in this, in the country, already produced? There's about 45,000, I think, today. Yeah. Uh, if we're, you know, 10 years down the road, that's another 20,000. Right? Okay, about, about 65,000, thereabouts. Um, when, it, it'll take, what, about five years to get the, the shipments up to what the DOE estimates are, I, approximately? I, wanna, I mean, we've estimated, I mean, we've used a conservative estimate right. in terms of the amount going to Yucca Mountain of 3,000 tons uh, per year. And but we produce and we produce 2,000 tons That's a, year. a function, though, of, 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 of a variety of factors, not the least of which is congressional decisions as to how much appropriation. You can move more, right. potentially, if Bottom Congress line, though, is your estimates are 3,000. Used a conservative. You produce 2,000. Right. You start with 65 thousand tons how many years does that get us to get to the waste to, to yucca mountain well you know that it's about a seventy thousand metric ton facility so it's about 23 years i guess wait a second you we're shipping three thousand a year we produce two thousand a year that's a net shipping of a thousand a year well you asked how long to fill the facility and the i didn't answer say fill i said ship all the stuff that we're going to have okay we produce three thousand a year or 2,000 a year. We ship 3,000 a year. That means we're netting out from what we have around the country going to Yucca Mountain about 1,000 a year. At the end of um, 23 years, we'll have 70,000 at Yucca Mountain. Mr. Secretary, just, just follow me here. You I'm produce, having, I'm trying. You produce 2,000 a year. Right. Okay. You ship 3,000 a year. You start with 65,000 metric tons of this stuff. Okay. Around the country, you have 65,000 metric tons, and you're producing an additional 2,000 a year. Right. But if you're only shipping 3,000 a year, that means that you're net taking from around the country to Yucca Mountain about 1,000. What it means by my calculation is that at the end of 23 years, you'll have 70,000 in Yucca Mountain instead of at the, uh, the countless three. sites around the country. That's the bottom line. There'll be 70,000 metric yeah, they, tons I agree that with will that. not be at these temporary sites I agree with at that. the 131 the Secretary, I agree with that. The point I'm trying to make is there still will be all this we'll still nuclear be producing waste. producing more, and there's no question. Not only that, not only producing more, there'll still be nuclear waste all over the country for many, many decades right. to come. I would predict two things. First, that yes, there will be, and that it'll be at more sites than we have today because a lot of the current sites will decide they should move off-site the waste that's currently stored there. So instead of 131 sites, you're going to have it at more sites if okay. we don't move ahead. Okay, this but, but the bottom line is we're not going to just have one site. And that's kind of what you've led people to believe is we're going to have one site. This stuff is going to be around, so there are still going to be a lot of targets out there. You've talked about national security that it would be safer to have it at one site. Well, if you could scoop it all up and have it at one site, I would agree with you, but it's not going to be that way. We're going to have it at sites around the country. And I don't mean to be combative here. I, I, I just want to I just want to make I'm sure that we your fully concern. understand that there are many sites and there will continue to be many sites as senator Reed pointed out it takes at least five to ten years to cool right these but, cooling ponds but senator is as you know we have a number of decommissioned sites right now and if i we agree can with move that. it from there those will be done instead of the current decommissioned site i think you have a point there. also at the department of energy sites uh, where we are hoping to close the site we will be able to do that if we have yucca mountain okay now, now i want to get to the transportation sure. because because there's no question that there will be many many sites out there not just one site get to the transportation issue the transportation of nuclear waste uh, the when you transport it you cannot surround it with as much concrete obviously because of the weight factors is when you store it on site these canisters that are going to surround these things you can surround them with more concrete than you can when transport them 
Well, um, yes. That, I mean, it's obvious. That would seem obvious. Yes. Obvious. Okay. The the point is is that when you transport them, you do subject them. You've seen, I'm sure you've seen the video of the of the tow missile breaching one of these things. Right. And they said I that. I point they, out to the center that the yeah. tow missile was not breaching a transportation cask, but one of the permanent storage casks. Correct. But there have not been those studies done on the transportation cask. Well, the, correct. The, the, but the point is, you're you're recommending we would keep these in storage at the current sites, and it was in fact one of those casks that got penetrated by a tow missile. But not with the concrete surrounding it. Well, well, we we haven't tested that, but the you you raise the issue of the of the of the cask being penetrated, but but you haven't. That's the kind of cask we're talking about. It's the one you're talking the about. The point is, is that we ha why move forward? Where we haven't studied some of these things. That's the, the, this is your. Well, we're raising not going to we're, we're, we're not going to transport these except in nuclear regulatory commission certified transportation uh, casks. I mean, we're not going to just put them in garbage cans and move them across the country. We've done it right. here and in Europe without any harmful radiation exposure and the, over the last 30 years. And, Mr. Secretary, the point that we're, we're trying to make is that, first of all, dry cast storage, according to the DOE, is safe for 100 years. These containers are safe for 100 years. If they're not safe, then we have a major problem in the country. Okay, we, and, and, and I agree, we need to make them even more safe than they are today. But the point is that they can store this stuff, according to the DOE, for, for 100 years. Bottom line is we have time to study transportation in a better way than we have today. There is no hurry. Yucca Mountain is what, $58 billion, according to the latest estimates, $57, $58 billion. Okay? Right. Over the 1995 estimate, it was what, 30 something billion? And then 1998 estimate, it was 48, 40. $8 billion, $47 billion. Now, 2001 estimate, it's up to $58 billion. And the DOE has said that's not even the final number. Senator, the uh, rules changes that continue to take place uh, that we have had to adjust and there may be a major factor. Bottom line in that is, change. it's incredibly expensive. That's is the same amount of money as all 12 of our aircraft carriers combined. It is it's a an huge amount of money. Process and the American tax ratepayers have already been and will continue to be paying for. But it. they won't They've pay enough to pay for Yucca Mountain. We at believe those at this point that uh, that our actuarial tables suggest that the that the the monies being sent uh, will in fact meet the current projected costs. Uh, by what year? I'm I'm not sure. I'd have to put that. Could into you the get that number for get that number for us? The point that we're trying to make is one that the dry cast containers are good for a hundred years. Two is, why risk the transportation when we haven't completely fully studied the transportation? And because there is no hurry to go forward with Yucca Mountain, if dry cast storage is good and safe for 100 years, don't risk the transportation. Let's take some of the money and invest it to what Senator Domenici is talking about. Instead of building Yucca Mountains, take some of that nuclear waste trust fund money and put it into the recycling technology. We don't know whether it's going to work or not, but we have time. If we have 100 years, what is the hurry? And I would suggest to you that the DOE has been very, very biased in its, in its view toward Yucca Mountain. And the reason that I would say, say that, I would point it out obviously. You, in earlier testimony, said that there was not, you don't know what you're going to do if we don't go forward with Yucca Mountain. We don't know what we're going to do. Well, to ha not have plan B in place, or at least be thinking of plan B, I think is irresponsible for the DOE. That indicates to me that what if Yucca Mountain would have proved not suitable? You're watching public affairs programming on C-SPAN 2. And we're going to leave this recorded program to bring you live coverage of a briefing on U.S. military training and aid programs hosted by the Institute for Policy Studies. Our live coverage from the Russell Senate Office Building is expected to last about 90 minutes. This has just begun. Uh, session today called U.S. Foreign Military Training.